Hi everyone, I'm Bill Kelly. Welcome aboard. Tonight, a fascinating story about two men from Notre Dame Bay who left home one day in search of better fishing grounds, fully intending to return to their wives at the end of the summer. Well, that was nearly 20 years ago, and they're still not back, preferring instead to live reclusively in total isolation. Oh, they do get to see their wives every once in a while, but other than that, they're completely on their own, and they wouldn't have it any other way. One guy even spends Christmas by himself. A bit odd, you say? Perhaps, but the men are doing better at the fishery now than they could have ever expected. And as Pauline Thornhill reports, they're as happy as clams, marching along to the beat of a very different drummer. Placentia Bay, just after dawn. In many ways, it's a mysterious bay, often plagued with fog full of nooks and crannies. The bay is peppered with tiny islands, sanctuaries for seagulls, and graveyards for old abandoned lobster pots, tributes to past generations of lobster fishermen. The lobster fishery still flourishes in Placentia Bay. In early morning, fishermen's boats still dot the waters around the island. Carl Wheaton knows these islands like the back of his hand. He's even put names on most of them. He's fished lobsters here for almost two decades. Carl is captivated by Placentia Bay. To see him so at home on these waters, you swear he grew up on them. But oddly enough, he didn't. Carl is a native of Notre Dame Bay, a bay he's long since turned his back on. Ice drove him out, ice that constantly delayed the lobster season constantly destroyed hundreds of dollars worth of gear. One year, the ice stayed so long, there was no lobster fishery at all. Carl had it at that point. He vowed he'd find a bay where he could make a go of it at lobsters, an ice-free bay where he could fish in comfort. It was a calculated decision, one he made with this man his nephew, Lloyd Wheaton, also a lobster fisherman, also from Notre Dame Bay, and totally at wit's end with ice. The first year that I went lobster kitchen, I think it was seven times we had to take off our traps. So he's coming in, and, and besides, we lost a lot. Together, they set out to find the perfect bay. Together, they decided on Placentia Bay, and they brought their wives out the next season. That was 18 years ago. Carl and Lloyd could have picked any one of a dozen places in Placentia Bay, all ice-free, all with flourishing lobster fisheries. But they overlooked those. Instead, they chose a place that had been forgotten by most, a place people had long since abandoned. They chose Prouston. About nine families once called this little place home. They eventually buckled under the weight of life without a proper school, without a telegraph office, and eventually without even a coastal boat. So they left. Like so many others in Placentia Bay, isolation drove them out. When Carl and Lloyd found Prouston, there was only one house standing and one family back to fish for the summer. It's a place that touched Carl and Lloyd from the start. They became endeared to Prouston. It felt right. The pace of life began to grow on them and the fishery was fantastic. So both men started spending more and more time here, less and less time with their wives and families in Notre Dame Bay. Joyce had to get used to not having Carl around. She doesn't thrive in Prouston the way her husband does. After a while, she finds the isolation tiresome, so she usually just joins her husband for the lobster season. 
She's happy enough here for that length of time, especially now that things are more comfortable. That first summer, things were rough. There was no cabin for her and Carl, only an old gear shed down on the wharf, a tiny old gear shed. End of the evening, you put out your bed, you put out your table, and then you put in your bed for to go to sleep. So in the mornings when you get up, you put out your bed and you put in your table. And that's how we live. There was no, uh, there was no uh, bridge to it. There's only two planks going on. And I'm afraid of weight, so I didn't enjoy that very much. I just find a bed dirty weather, because when you're only in one little room place, after a couple of days, dirty weather, like, place is getting smaller and smaller, see? You feel like you're going up the wall. <laughs> Back then, Joyce never dreamed Carl would take to Prouston the way he has, that he would spend so much time here, and that she'd still be baking bread here 18 years later. Bernice didn't think she'd still be gardening here either, but for her, it's a pleasure. Like her husband Lloyd, she's fallen victim to Prouston's charm. She loves it here. Well, I don't feel isolated. It's never been too windy that you can't get out of there, I don't think. It hasn't been any time I've been here, anyway, if I want to leave. Well, even though you don't feel isolated, don't you feel lonely sometimes? No. I never feel lonely. No, it was just, just myself and Lloyd, I feel just as the same as if just a, a dozen here. Bernice hasn't been able to spend as much time in Prouston as she'd like to. She and Lloyd have four children. They're all grown now, but when they were in school, Bernice had to go back to Notre Dame Bay every fall. But she'd never miss a chance to bring them back to Prouston, even when the girls were tiny. Bernice's youngest daughter cut her first tooth here. Oh, this is, this is second home. It really is now, even for the children as well as us because now, well, they're all grown, and they live in town, so they just, it's really good for them to come out, and I guess they feel as much at home there as we do. Cutting up bait for the next morning, part of the routine of early summer in Prouston, part of the way of life Carl and Lloyd have so comfortably fallen into and part of the lobster fishery that's treated them so well. Carl and Lloyd did better with lobsters here than they ever dared imagine. They came in hopes of a better fishery to do as well as they had in Notre Dame Bay without losing any gear. Turns out they did better, much better. The last season Lloyd was in Notre Dame Bay, he made $700 at lobsters. His first year here, he made 7,000. But Carl and Lloyd had to work for their success, especially in the beginning. Well, we were working mostly in from daylight to dark, whatever, whatever time daylight came, whatever time dark came. That was the usual though. So it wasn't your standard eight-hour day. No standard eight-hour days. There never is. There never is in, in this. In, in most most places where fishermen are too, the, the the government builds the wharves for them, and you know, build a slipway and. So that, that, we had to do a lot, a lot of extra, extra work there. You know, we, we had to do it ourselves. You know, there was, uh, there, was, there was no the government that didn't, didn't do anything for us. And was it worth it? Oh yeah, oh yeah, 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 worth it. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, look back, we appreciate every every moment. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. There must have been some points in time when you looked back and said, "We shouldn't have come. We shouldn't have moved." Not for me. No, my dear. No, no. <laughs> no, so, never. No, never. never ever. No. Put Lloyd on the water now, and he's the picture of contentment, especially when there's lobsters on the go. But it wasn't always like this. Back in Notre Dame Bay, there were sleepless nights, lots of them. Lloyd never made enough at lobsters to keep his family fed. He always had to go away in search of other work. Sometimes it was truck driving, sometimes it was construction work. But he always needed something to see him through till the next year. It seemed Lloyd could never count on lobsters like this one back in Notre Dame Bay, and it got to the point where he didn't know where the next job was coming from. It was a heavy burden to carry, 
a burden he happily left back in Notre Dame Bay. Here, Lloyd doesn't have to look beyond the next lobster pot. He strikes jackpot with this one, four lobsters, all big enough to keep. The Wheatons don't just work on the water, they play there too. It's supper there after now, scallops. Carl and Lloyd discovered this place ages ago. At low tide, it's almost a saltwater pool, tucked away around a nook in Placentia Bay, teeming with scallops. <laughs> On calm evenings, when the tides are right, the Wheatons can slip in here and literally pick their supper from the ocean floor. That's a good one. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't wear an easy yeah. to do with that one. Oh that's my god, that's a, that's a dummy. Oh no, that was empty. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's empty. You'll never find scallops as fresh as these in a restaurant, and you'll certainly never eat in a place with this kind of atmosphere. A little hideaway, one of Placentia Bay's many secrets. Everything is so peaceful and quiet and natural. That's the only way I can describe it. You can, uh, you can see something that's beautiful every day. Every day you get up and go out there, you can see something beautiful. If you like nature, that is. Like the eagles and the bears and the moose, there's always something to see, and then you can do your day's work. This is a really beautiful spot. Lobsters are also on the supper menu. There's nothing to boil them in out here, they're just thrown on the open fire. Before long, they steam in their shells. There's no frying pans here either, scallops are roasted like marshmallows. The sea's bounty for those who know where to look. Oh, gee, is that ever good? Mmm, just right. Yeah. Oh, dear good. Now, I think when the fire gets going, we're going to have, have a big pot of tea. That's going to touch everything right off. It does indeed the perfect ending to the perfect meal. Yeah. It's the kind of summer's evening most of us would remember forever. For Carl and Lloyd, it's just the end of another day, part of a way of life they've rediscovered in Prouston and have come to cherish. We'll show you more after the break. Welcome back to Prouston. You know, it may not seem that unusual that people would come back to an abandoned community to fish for the summer, even though few come from as far away as the Wheatons did. But have you ever heard of people coming back to an abandoned community to live permanently? That's exactly what Carl and Lloyd Wheaton have done. Prouston is no longer just a place to fish in the summertime. Prouston is home. It didn't take long before Lloyd and Carl decided they were staying in Prouston year-round. It wasn't a hard decision for Lloyd. He stays for peace of mind. There are no sleepless nights in Prouston. He goes to bed knowing he has a job to wake up to, knowing he can make a living from the sea. Prouston gives him that, 
that and the tranquility of isolation. You're living the same sort of life that your parents would have lived. I'm living the same kind of, yeah, about the same kind my parents used to live. And not that much from the way I used to live because I was brought up with no electricity. We didn't get electricity until 1963 before, before I saw a light bulb. So it's just bringing back old times to me that I can relate to. These people who, who are living in, in cities, what are the things that you feel that they're missing, the things that you have that they don't? Well, just freedom to start with. Uh, I guess that's their way of life, and they wouldn't be able to accept this way of life that I got here. But uh, when I leave here and go into the city, I feel like I'm in, I'm in a jungle then. That's when I'm in the jungle. So did you think, ever imagine that when you first came here 18 years ago, you'd be living here now? No, I never. Actually, I never thought I'd ever be living here. <clears throat> but after I was here four or five years, I thought I might be. Didn't take long. He misses Bernice terribly when she goes back to Notre Dame Bay. But even then, Lloyd is happier here than anywhere else. He's found a kind of peace in Prouston, a peace he never knew in Notre Dame Bay. Carl has carved out a lifestyle that fits him like a glove. He's even more content here than Lloyd, if you can imagine that. He spends more time alone than Lloyd, but that's not a problem for him. He just as soon do things his way with no distractions. So naturally, he's learned to fend for himself over the years, especially when it comes to food. The only thing that I don't bottle is lobsters, but the only thing. I bottle everything else. Yeah, um, rabbit, uh, turn, ducks, and, and bottle trout, and bottle salmon, you know, there's a, you even yeah. bottle cod tongues, don't you? Oh, yeah, bottle cod tongues, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, cape them, do, do cape them, and put them in sauce. And... Yeah, I'm not going to go to store for nothing, hardly. <laughs> now, what's your grocery bill like, Carl? Well, uh, when, I'm, uh, when I'm by myself, $10 a week, maximum. That's it. Carl's gone back to the diet of his grandparents. He enjoys living off the land. He trusts the food he prepares himself. It might seem basic, but Carl believes it's healthy. Throw in a cube of salt beef for flavor, and the fish is ready to go. There are no other additives and no chemicals. Sprayed on everything, apples, you name it, oranges, grapes, no matter, no matter what, it's always sprayed with chemicals. You know? A lot of it is... Not to keep the bugs off, is it just to make the thing look nice, you know? And uh, I don't think that it should ever be. Carl believes the trick to bottling is in the boiling. He boils everything for at least three hours. Only then is he secure enough to leave the food on the shelf for any length of time. Not the cupboard shelf, oh, mind you, the root cellar shelf. Carl's root cellar is his pride and joy. It's blocked with all the different types of foods he prepares himself, enough to feed an army. There's no fear of anyone going hungry in Prouston. The codfish takes its place next to the moose stew, another ready-made meal in a bottle. If you poke around, you'll even find dessert down here. Those are bottled grapes there in the corner. Months of meals in a jar. Carl is dug in here now. You couldn't blow him out of Prouston with dynamite. He even plans to retire here. In fact, he's gone further than that. He's actually built himself a retirement home. It sits on the hill above the cabin he lives in now empty, waiting for him to turn 65. Carl refuses to move until he's 65. He figures he'd only dirty the place up if he moved while he was still fishing. He built this place from scratch. It took three summers and a lot of thought. If I do it over again, I don't think I'd, uh, I'd change one board. No, not the, not the one. Could you see all of this in your mind before you started building it, or did it take shape after you started? No, I could see it all in my mind. It was, uh, you know, it was all, 
all there, but it was, it was slow to get it out, you know, sort of thing. And, but it was all in my mind, everything. Yeah, the, the thin fittings up there, every board is, is, is different, a different shape. So, uh, you know, you, you couldn't make a, a pattern. So everyone had to be done with a pocket knife. Everyone was, every one of them was there. I, I spent probably about half a day to, to doing that much there. Every just, edge was cut with a pocket yeah, knife? Yeah, every edge was cut with a pocket knife, yeah. It took me uh, about half a day to do that little, little, little space there. So this is the house you want to retire in? Yeah, this is the house I want to retire in. I wouldn't change this place for no place on earth. Not, not on earth, I mean around the globe. This is it. You turn on, you're on your radio and you, you hear about uh, so much corruption on the outside. Uh, you know, when you hear that, about, you know, that, uh, I, I, I says, look, oh, I'm certainly blessed to be here. You know, then I look out the window, go out the door. It was in the night, I heard something on the news. You know, take my binoculars, uh, look up at the moon, you know, the stars. Oh, isn't it peaceful and quiet? Well, you know, where, where can you find a better place in the world than here? That's what I say to myself, and I, I do that quite often, in the run of the year, quite often. Charles reached the point now where he doesn't even leave Prouston for Christmas. It sounds hard to believe, anyone preferring to be alone Christmas Day, but it suits Carl just fine. If the weather's good, you'll find him on the water Christmas Day. Christmas dinner is usually fresh fish. He insists he's not lonely when Joyce isn't here. He has his radio and his magazines for company. He has a mobile phone. He has a 10-day supply of penicillin for emergencies. Carl Wheaton wouldn't change a thing. I got what millionaires haven't got, you know. That's the way I feel. This is the quietest place uh, that I know that I can live, uh, is here. Now, there might be many more places, but, but this is where uh, I got my home to. And this is where uh, I'm used to now. And, this is all. Carl and Lloyd Wheaton count themselves among the privileged. They're among the few who are satisfied with their lives, among the few who found their niche. They came here looking for a better fishery, and they found it. But at the same time, they stumbled on something much bigger than that, and much more precious. They found a whole other way of life, one that's brought contentment and peace of mind. Placentia Bay has given them those gifts.